Good morning, everyone. I just want to make sure you know that we are here. We're going to wait a few more minutes until we've reached how many registrants we think are coming, and then we will get started with our program. Thanks so much. Good morning, everyone. I will confess my name is Christine Mascolo. I'm an admissions officer here at Harvard College. I will confess this is a rather surreal experience um, for us as it is for you. Um, I am so lucky, though, um, and you are so lucky to not have to listen to me for an hour. Um, I am so pleased to have a current Harvard student here with us to talk about her experiences and perspectives, um, and I will let her introduce herself. Hi everyone, good morning. My name is Artha Jonasa and I am a rising sophomore at the college studying government and global health. And upon return to Harvard, I'll be living in Kirkland House. We also have the, the brains behind the operation. I have a colleague um, who doesn't need to, to introduce herself if she doesn't want, but just so you understand the setup of this morning, we're going to go through, much like we would in person, um, some, uh, some slides with accompanying beauty shots um, and interwoven into what, what I sort of share about Harvard College, realizing that some of you may know nothing, some of you may know some things. Um, I'm going to ask Artha to, to really add the life. Um, for example, I'm going to tell you, you know, there are 3,700 courses offered here every year. Great. That sounds like a lot. What does that mean? Um, and what does that mean for a, a freshman as, as Artha has just finished her, her first year? Um, so that should take us roughly, I don't know, 30 to 40 minutes. Please know um, all during that time. Um, well, so my colleague Tia is monitoring the chat. Um, and if there are questions that uh, we haven't sort of hit on, and financial aid and admissions will be woven into this presentation along with some updates um, around the, the pandemic. Um, she'll, be, she'll be sending questions my way. She'll also be answering questions, um, uh, typing furiously. Um, so we'll, we'll try to, to have everyone engaged in that way. Um, I just want to take a minute as we start, though, um, to recognize what an incredibly challenging and tumultuous time this has been for everyone in, in, in the world. Um, from the pandemic to um, the protests and the horrors that we've witnessed um, against black people um, recently and often and always. Um, and we just want to note that, um, you know, we know this has been an incredibly difficult time for, for, for students, for families, for us, um, and wanted to, to share that um, we are committed to um, standing with our students, especially our students of color, our black students, and um, making sure they feel supported and that all of us are taking time to educate ourselves um, at this really pivotal moment in time. Um, so please know that, that we know there is a lot going on. On the one hand, how great that you're all taking time to visit Harvard. So in some ways, you know, the, the world marches on, but there's a lot of really important work happening now, and we know that, and we know you're under more stress than you, than you may normally be. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that. 
Um, with that, I promised you beauty shots. Here's our kind of number one beauty shot. I want to welcome you to Harvard. We're sorry you're not here in person, but we will do our very best. We are the oldest college in the country, founded in 1636. Thank goodness we're not the Harvard of 1636, though. Um, I would not be here. Artha wouldn't be here. Tia wouldn't be here. Um, and so we really work hard to try to find a balance. And sometimes it's difficult between being, being proud of our history, some of our history, um, not all of it, but recognizing that we are educating students in the 21st century. You can't just walk around saying you're the oldest college in the country that that gets old. Um, we are perfectly medium sized as colleges go. So we have about 6,600 undergraduates, which makes normally, and I should have, I should preface my whole presentation with, there are lots of caveats and asterisks here, especially when we get to residential life related to the pandemic. And I will do my very best to give you the most updated information that I have. But typically we have 6,600 undergraduates on campus, um, which makes for an incoming first year class that is typically around 1665 or so. Um, you'll see this, this beautiful river. This is the Charles River. For those of you who don't know, we are located in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, which is right across this river is Boston. Um, it's about 10 minutes away um, on the T, downtown Boston. Um, it's truly America's college town. Our population goes up a quarter million every Labor Day, and it's all students. Um, and the average age drops 10 years on the very same day. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a fun place to, to live and learn for, for four years. There we go. Um, one of the hallmarks of, of life at Harvard, and again, please bear in mind the, the caveats that, that may be coming for this year, is residential life. Um, I'll note that Harvard has not made an announcement on whether anyone will be in residence next year or what that will look like. Um, we're expecting some kind of announcement in the next couple of weeks. You may know that many colleges have made various announcements. So we're working on it and we'll be there in the next couple of weeks. Um, but normally, um, uh, residential life is one of the hallmarks of this place. 98% of students live on campus for all four years, again, under normal circumstances. Um, and that starts right away the freshman year. Um, again, it's, it's perfect in some ways to talk about this first year. Artha has just finished her first year in a way she probably never could have imagined, um, and yet she had, you know, eight months to kind of save her um, being in Cambridge. Artha, I wonder if you wouldn't mind kind of jumping in and sharing what it was like living um, in Harvard Yard, which is where all of the freshmen live or just outside of Harvard Yard, and what that experience was like for you. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, living on Harvard's campus right in the heart of Harvard Yard ha was absolutely incredible for me. Um, I lived in Thayer Hall, which is in the yard, very close to the Science Center and the beautiful first year dining hall, Annenberg. And I had one other roommate and we separated our um, common space and our bedroom so that we both had our own singles for the entire year, which made for really nice living. And we had a communal bathroom and all of the first years are assembled into entryways, which is like a microcosm of the dorm in general. So Thayer Hall, for example, has five floors and every floor is an entryway that has a proctor who is a graduate student or a Harvard affiliate who gets to kind of monitor all of the students who live in their entryway, just ensuring that they have sound mental health and that they're surviving and all of that great stuff. And you also have a peer advising fellow, which is an upperclassman or an upper level student rather, who gets to check in on you from time to time to ensure that your first year is going as well as it can be, or if it's not, how they can support you um, in your Harvard endeavors. So I absolutely loved my first year experience in the yard because like I said earlier, you're so close to that first year dining hall, which is pictured in the bottom right hand um, corner of the screen, Annenberg. All of the first years get to eat in this dining hall. So you at some point or another probably see all of the people that are in your class at a meal. And it's so nice to come after a class and talk to people who are like, oh my goodness, what even happened in that lecture? Or do you even understand what our essay is about? And just really having the chance to connect with so many students. Um, aside from that, I had so many um, great classes, which I'm sure we'll get into soon, but 
living in the yard is great. You're so close to anything that you need. So whether that's mental health services or Harvard University Health Services, HUHS is the um, acronym for that. You're so, so close to everything that you could ever need. And you're close to the square, which is full of lots of great restaurants if the dining hall gets old. Thanks, Artha. I'm also, I'm, I'm just wondering because a lot of students in the audience are, you know, about to kind of be where you were last, I don't know, June, July, August, September. What was your transition like um, to, to Harvard um, in terms of size, in terms of, you know, leaving home? Right. So um, my transition was a very cool one. I took a gap year between high school and college, so I had a year off to kind of explore interest and really work and see what it is that makes me happy and what sets my soul on fire beyond the scope of academia. And so moving on to Harvard's campus was a very big jump uh, for me. I'm from a small town in South Florida, and I'm pretty sure if you could like juxtapose two cities and you put Cambridge and Okeechobee, Florida next to each other, they would be the like most completely different places on earth. So it was a little, and not a little, very scary to jump into life at Harvard, but I quickly made friends, quickly got accustomed to the life there because of the resources that were avail available to me as a first year student. Um, and it really was not as scary as I anticipated. So the transition was kind of, daunting at first especially this time last year i was like i'm not gonna have any friends i'm gonna just cry in bed all day and of course that wasn't true at all i got involved in lots of great um communities and extracurriculars but they do they as in harvard does such a great job in ensuring that you have all the resources that you need in order to make harvard a home in your first few weeks on campus Terrific. Thanks, Artha. And then I just have one more question because I would want to know this if I, I did want to know this. How do you end up with your roommates? Who are these people? Did you pick them? Do you have to know someone? <laughs> that is such a great question. So during the summer of your, before your first year at Harvard, they send you this very robust questionnaire and they ask lots of kind of intrusive questions like how early do you wake up how late do you stay up um, what kind of music do you like uh, how many roommates would you like to have or what's the maximum what's the minimum all of these different kinds of questions and using an algorithm they match you with another person or group of people who consists of your roommates and i lived with one other person however that you can be matched with up to one to seven other people during your first year so you may have a suite of roommates, a suite of eight in which there's a common room and then a number of bedrooms uh, surrounding the common room, but you all share one space. So it's kind of random. I got matched with an amazing human being as my first year roommate. She also took a gap year. So we had that in common and we had another, a lot of other parts of our, identi our identity in common as well so we got to do lots of other extracurriculars and spend time outside of our dorm together as well and I don't know what kind of magic they put into this algorithm but most students love whoever they are matched with. Terrific thank you so much Artha. Um, so moving on um, we've, we've captured freshman year in you know two minutes um, which of course is, is not you know how it really goes but toward the end of your freshman year, um, again, in a normal, in a normal year, um, which we know this isn't, you and a group uh, of, of friends who you choose now, you have choice, you've gotten to make relationships over the year, um, the up to eight of you um, choose, uh, will enter the housing lottery. And uh, lottery is a bit of a misnomer. Again, remember I said um, housing is guaranteed all four years normally, and virtually all of our students live on campus all four years. But um, much like the algorithm that Artha mentioned, um, which is, has a heavy dose of, of humanness to it, um, this group of you and sev up to seven other people will be randomly assigned to one of our 12 upper class houses. This is a shot of one of them. And you will live in that house for the next three years. Um, you may change your roommates, you will certainly change your rooms, but you are a part of this 
house community for the next three years. And it really is a is a community. It's not just a building. I mean, we, we call it, we should probably call them homes, but um, we call them houses for a reason. Now they don't look like this doesn't look like my house. These are these are big systems of buildings. Typically, there are 350 to 500 students in each house. Again, that may need to change because of, of, of social distancing. Um, but so the, these are, they're meant to be microcosms of the college itself. And because they are random in terms of, of the assignment, but again, you have your group of friends, they really are able to achieve that. So you meet people in your house, even though Harvard's not huge, 6,600 is probably more students than you all go to high school with, certainly more than I went to high school with, and I went to a biggish high school. Um, so you'll be meeting these different groups of friends, um, really meant to be kind of a cross-section of Harvard as a whole. Arthur mentioned advising in relation to the freshman year. Advising doesn't stop. You're, you know, you think you're a sophomore and you know everything. Of course not. It, it shifts, but it is very much tied to residential life, which is kind of a neat way to think about it. So each house will have, um, in addition to its own dining hall, its own library, its own computer facilities, and other physical amenities and spaces, um, a system of advisors living right in the house with you. Um, and uh, they span the discipline. So each house, we call them tutors. Each house will have a bio tutor, an English tutor, etc. Um, they also have um, pre-professional pre tutors. Um, Harvard is a liberal arts college, and as such, you're not going to major in journalism. In uh, Even in, in, in pre-med, we have plenty of pre-med students, but you're not going to major in that. Um, business, we have economics. You can go into business, but you're not going to major in business. So, But each of the houses has um, a tutor to help students navigate the application processes to, to graduate schools, if that's something that you're interested in. And each of these houses is overseen by a faculty dean. They live in the house with you um, in their own you know, beautiful accommodations with their spouse or partner or children or plants or dogs, whatever comes with them, really creating Again, a sense of home. They're a, they're a grand parental or a parental figure, um, and they get to know the students quite well. And will host you know various um, social gatherings for for students. Um, and these are um, these are tenured faculty members either at Harvard College or at one of our professional schools. Um, so they're they're again kind of a, a they're a tremendous resource. Um, so residential life is is really um, an important piece of of what we do. And again, it may look different um, next year. Um, but I expect that it will continue to be um, a, a crucial part to what we do. I'm not going to put Artha on the spot because she hasn't lived, she hasn't done this yet. Um, but I'm sure she's, I'm sure she's looking forward to it. Um, we should mention this at the outset, and I hope it's obvious, but if it isn't, I'll mention it. Your first job at Harvard will be as a student. Um, we are primarily an academic institution. Yes, we love our residential life. Yes, we'll talk about extracurriculars. But this is a scholarly enterprise. And so to that end, the learning opportunities are tremendous, both in terms of depth and in terms of breadth. Um, I mentioned earlier, over 3,700 courses offered, both at courses you may take at Harvard College, and maybe you spend all your time taking courses at Harvard College, totally fine. But maybe you take courses at um, many of our graduate or professional schools. Um, maybe you cross-register down the street to our wonderful peer, um, MIT, um, and take classes down there that aren't offered at Harvard, and vice versa. Their students come up and take classes here at Harvard. 98% um, of our courses are taught by faculty members, so a couple of exceptions there. Intro foreign language, um, a freshman writing requirement, and introductory math courses. Everything else is taught by faculty members. Faculty should be anywhere you end up, a huge part of your experience. They're an incredible resource. Um, they're teachers for a reason. Um, they want to be interacting with students. They all will have office hours. Um, and um, in addition to sort of the classroom learning, there's so much other learning that happens, whether it's um, in one of our many academic centers, whether it's at the Innovation Lab, which focuses on um, entrepreneurship for students, where they can kind of go and experiment. Um, the, Again, your first job is as a student, and so we set you up for success in that arena. We have the largest university library system in the world, 17 million volumes, I'm told. I have not counted, um, but that's the statistic, um, again, spread across campus um, that students have access to, of course. Um, with your Harvard ID, opens up this entire world. 
Um, so with that, again, such a huge part of life, I want to pause um, and give Arthur the chance to weigh in. Again, focusing more on the academic side, what were, did you, were there surprises for you about the classes at Harvard? I'm going to throw a lot at you. You can ignore some of it. Did you, do you know what you want to study? Uh, what were some of your classes like? Did you take a freshman seminar? Anything you want to share with us? Yeah, so um, the academic landscape of Harvard is just so, so, so robust. I Like we just heard, there are over 3,700 courses in the course catalog. And as a first-year student who took a year off of school, so I kind of forgot how to school in a lot of ways, I was just so, so overwhelmed, but you quickly, you are equipped with an academic advisor as a first year student to help you navigate what may be a general education requirement, or maybe you want to explore different concentrations and you want to kind of knock out concentration requirements, all of these different kind of uh, landscapes and aspects of our um, academic landscape were really important in me choosing whatever courses that I wanted to explore. Coming into college, it, I really had a passion and still have a passion for food security and food policy and how that comes to life in the U.S. and abroad and how we can use government tools in order to ensure that every home, despite socioeconomic status, despite any kind of other factors, has access to healthy, affordable food. So. I didn't really know how that would kind of shake up or shake out as a Harvard student because there isn't like an agricultural studies major. However, Harvard with 3,700 courses, there's a very good chance that there's going to be some overlap, even if you have a super specific interest like I did. Um, and that came into, and that, for me, that looked like taking intro courses in government, just understanding how policy works because I do intend on concentrating in government. Um, and then what Christine mentioned a little, she kind of slipped it in there, there are freshman seminars. And freshman seminars are easily the coolest thing to me about Harvard's um, academic landscape because they give first-year students the opportunity to learn from super awesome, renowned uh, professionals in their field of study in very intimate settings. So these classes have no more than 15 students and they're on you and they're usually on very specific topics. So they might not they may be on the human genome, they might be on the Supreme Court and really impactful um, cases and how they came into fruition. And I took a, a freshman seminar during my first semester entitled Food Up Close and Personal. And we got to navigate what nutrition looks like in the human body, how food security impacts um, the American landscape and across the globe, what food security looks like. And it really tailored to all of my. There are so many of them, I should add. I think there's over a hundred freshman seminars. Don't quote me on that, but something in that realm. So there's something for everyone. And it's really, really cool way to make connections in a field as a first year, as the entire class are first years, the people who came into Harvard with you. Um, and there are just uh, so many different things to explore. Again, um, I found that I also have a passion for public health, and that was through a general education requirement that I took this semester. Even when I had to take that class at home, I was still so intrigued with all the material. I even did the, like, suggested reading that's not even part of the course because it's just that interesting and the faculty just made it so enga engaging even from home. So um, there's so much to explore and one of the great things about our academic landscape is that you don't have to declare a concentration or a major until the fall of your sophomore year. So you have nearly three semesters to explore so many different academic interests and areas. We have over 50 concentrations which are our fancy words for majors, and over 50 um, secondary concentrations, which are our minors. So you can definitely do whatever you want with them. And in the event you can't find a concentration that really feeds your soul, you can create a special concentration with the help of advisors at the college. So there's so much to learn. And really, this was one of the reasons I chose Harvard over different schools that I was picking between, because I had so much freedom and flexibility to make my education my own and to have um, autonomy over that experience. 
Thank you, Artha. Um, you reminded me. I I said I should keep you know sharing these caveats. Um, Artha mentioned the transition to online learning, um, which we did you know right around March. Um, even if we are in residence, I would expect that much. We expect that much of that learning will still occur online. But the amazing thing is the the great job that our faculty did in you know two weeks or less, really a week. Um, they're working on uh, pedagogies and creative ways to, to reach students. Um, they have much more time. Um, and so again, I just want to, to share that and be, be transparent about that. Um, moving on here, I think I touched on this because um, I'm a little rusty, but here, um, just to recount some of the academic resources. Um, I think someone has asked about research. Research can be part of any student's experience starting as soon as the freshman year. Again, that may look different, um, but research is so vitally important, as we've all learned. Um, this was one of the sectors of Harvard that is back up and running differently, but for um, and so we, we recognize the importance of that. Um, the nice thing about research at Harvard and, and that the fact that there are so many opportunities is that you don't have to have done it before. The, the reality is most high school students haven't. Um, so if you haven't, you have that chance. But if you have, you also have the chance to grow that skill um, if, you, you know, if you are beyond sort of introductory research. Um, another great thing about being in Boston and having professional schools, medical schools, schools of public health, um, Arthur mentioned her interest in that, is all of the incredible hospitals and medical facilities that are in the Boston area um, with which Harvard is affiliated, many of them, um, that, that students can, can, uh, can participate in. You might be getting credit. You might class credit for research. You might be getting paid. It might be during the summer. It might be during the year. It, all to say it can take so many different forms. Um, it's, it's like Artha said, it's, it's kind of what you make it. And that's in some ways Harvard in a, in a nutshell. Um, oh, there I am. I'm jumping ahead of myself. Lots and lots of research opportunities. The other thing to note is that not just in the biomedic, biosciences or physical sciences, there are also incredible opportunities in the social sciences and, um, and the humanities. I mentioned we're a liberal arts institution, so you can be working with faculty across the spectrum. I do want to mention um, our School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Now, you don't apply to it any differently. We don't expect you necessarily to know what you want to do, and applying, you know, being undecided is in no way a, um, a negative in the application process. It's the most common check, in fact. But um, the fact that we have a, it's been dubbed its own school should signify how important the, uh, the engineering sciences are to us, and they are. But done within the liberal arts framework. So you will still, you will take your engineering courses, but you will still take classes across a spectrum, but through our gen ed program that, that Arthur mentioned, which basically is our way of ensuring that you have been exposed to other fields, other ways of thinking. The nice thing about this, though, I should have mentioned earlier, is that no Harvard student is bound to take X class. You take classes within, um, you know, you have some choice within different fields. You have, you know, dozens of classes to choose from that will fulfill the same requirement. Um, so, and engineers are no different. Um, we think we want to ed educate Renaissance engineers. And so um, the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, CS, we call it, is an incredible incredible resource. The student to faculty ratio at Harvard, which I've not mentioned yet, is seven to one. It's about three to one in C's. Um, so again, incredible access to uh, lab space and faculty and, and again, research opportunities. While your first job will be as a student, it is not your only job by any means. Um, life outside of the classroom is incredibly vibrant. Um, public service is one of our biggest activities. Um, uh, there are sports and political organizations and religious organizations and cultural organizations, um, over 450. And the number kind of grows. We have to keep track of it so we're being accurate because students continually come and want to start different things. Um, I don't know, Arthur, if you are comfortable either sharing your own activities or more broadly, like what some of your friends and roommates are doing, just to kind of give people a flavor um, of the kinds of experiences you can have outside of the classroom. And maybe like, can you do, how can you do them and still be a good student and you know, manage your academics? Definitely. So um, I particularly enjoy Harvard's very large extracurricular landscape because Aside from being an academic institution, since 98% of students live on campus, you want to make it somewhere that you want to have fun and that you enjoy. 
And I know that when I was in high school, I did a whole bunch of different extracurriculars, some of which really fed my soul and made me happy, and some of which were a little superficial. So, like, when I got to college and I had the opportunity to be super intentional about the extracurriculars that I was a part of and what I wanted to join and what I wanted to explore, I was super enthusiastic to have that experience. And for me, that just looked like jumping into only a handful of different activities on campus. One, a space that I'm particularly involved with in is the Association of Black Harvard Women. It's a cultural affinity group for people who identify as Black women or with Black women, womanhood. And um, we do all kinds of things like professional development, personal development, just connections with other students who have that, who share that part of their identity with you. And it's just a space for me to like have homegirls and sisters and like just have so much fun with each other um, outside of the kind of constraints and maybe stressors of academic life. Another space that I'm really involved with is the Institute of Politics, which is at the Kennedy School of Government, the graduate school that studies politics and all the fun caveats of the American government and global governance in general. And there are so many different programs within that, but I worked with the Fellows and Study Groups program in which the six uh, visiting fellows who are residents at Harvard College, they lead study groups and um, have other events on campus to engage with students. And these fellows are esteemed politicians or public servants. So I worked under for a former social secretary at the White House who is responsible for planning all of the huge parties under the Obama administration. And she welcomed the Pope, Beyonce, and like literally every other cool person who ever stepped foot in the White House and um, during those eight years. And um, this, this semester, this past semester that was cut short, I worked with Tiffany Cross, who works in journalism and ensuring that uh, people of color are represented in the media in whatever forms. And she's a political commentator, and she does so many other cool things as well as just being a journalist. And those two groups have really, really fed my soul. I've dived deep into them. I, I'm just now becoming a rising sophomore, and I've already had leadership positions in both of those um, organizations. So I think that's a testament to how Harvard's extracurricular landscape also gives you the opportunity to grow as a leader and to like interact with so many different people if that's what you want it to be. Some people just enjoy the ride and enjoy um, those spaces kind of like as a someone on like a uh, observer rather than a leader and that's completely fine. I really enjoyed that role seeing that I had a lot of leadership positions in high school. It was nice to see and just enjoy everything and not have to put it all on myself, especially in my first year. Um, I'm seeing on this screen that there is a picture of students at the um, Harvard, like at a football game, and I'm a huge sports fan, and that's one of the reasons I picked Harvard. We have so many different athletic um, programs on campus, and you're in Boston, so we have the Red Sox, we have the Celtics, Gillette Stadium is far, um, it's not too far from campus, it's about 40 minutes away if you like the Patriots, so so much to do um, from a sports landscape as well. I highly, highly recommend the T, which is like our train, underground train thing. And it really helps you navigate the city of Boston super easily. I am from a rural place, so public transportation was totally new to me when I went to campus. But um, again, one of those things that you have a peer advising fellow, you have different friends from different places that they help you um, figure those kinds of things out. And, um, I think another important thing to realize is that you get to choose what you do on campus. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, like maybe your course load coupled with your extracurriculars are too much, you can totally back out of an extracurricular and there are no hard feelings. Students are totally understanding of how um, stressful school is and how stressful extracurriculars can be in addition to school. So you have full autonomy. You're basically like a mini adult living on Harvard's campus. So you get to make those choices for yourself. And for me, that meant taking a step back and choosing two or three places that I really wanted to devote my time and energy from. And uh, people are asking about how the winters are and navigating Harvard uh, as a Florida student. I cannot lie, it's pretty bad at first. 
people have been telling me that our winter this past year was pretty wimpy in Boston. But I'm telling you, I'm from South Florida, so I have never lived in snow. I've seen it. I've been there for like a couple of days at a time, but not nothing to the extent that I've um, experienced as a student at Harvard. But, you know, once you get uh, used to the snow boots and a parka everywhere you go, um, it's really not that bad. Um, a lot of my friends are also Southerners as well, so we're kind of in it together um, going through the Harvard winter. So I really did try to limit my outdoor activity and just try to like walk really quickly or Uber really quickly to somewhere and then um, go inside and it's warm. The heaters are everywhere, like nowhere in Cambridge, Boston exists without heat, um, a heating system. So uh, even if it is kind of brutal or the football games are really, really cold by the time November rolls around, um, it's still... It's still not that bad. It's an adjustment for sure. It's not an easy adjustment, but um, it's something that I've come to love. I don't love the cold, but I kind of love the experience of being able to have that with my friends and going to school in the Northeast more generally. Amazing. Thank you, Artha. Um, yeah, it was a wimpy winter. We'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. <laughs> um, so we'll technically only have you for four years, but we very much think of ourselves as creating lifelong communities. Um, and so you um, you may, some of you, um, I'll transition to admissions in a second. Some of you may meeting one of, maybe meeting one of our 10,000 plus alumni interviewers across the globe um, who volunteer for us just to get to meet you amazing students from their areas. Um, perhaps you find yourself with a job in a town where you know no one. There are 80 Harvard clubs across the globe, and so maybe you know, that, that becomes part of your home. Um, you are an alumnus or an alumna of Harvard forever and can also take advantage of the resources of, of career services, et cetera. If you are, you know, if I wanted to switch careers tomorrow, I would march myself into the Office of Career Services um, and, and rely on their help and expertise, as our students do, um, not just as seniors, though. This is a tremendous resource, um, starting as soon as your freshman year, if you want, in terms of summer jobs and, and things like that. Um, so the four years will fly. I can, I can promise you that. Um, financial aid, I think, is a really important topic for most families now more than ever. Um, but always, when you have a sticker price of $70,000, which is, you know, conveniently left off the slide, um, but really important things to note. Um, Admission to Harvard is need blind. What does that mean? It means that if you are applying for financial aid, that will never, ever negatively impact your application. We don't, we're very fortunate and have commitment of leadership that we don't have a certain amount of you know, students we need in X category of being able to pay. Um, we will spend this upcoming year, in fact, I'm sure that will go up as families' economic situations have changed so dramatically because of the pandemic, but we're expected to um, spend in the range of $200 million on financial aid, a number that is up exponentially in the past 10 to 15 years, as we have sought even, even more um, to, to seek out students from a wide array of socioeconomic backgrounds. Our overarching philosophy here is that financial need should not be the reason a student, once admitted to Harvard College, is not able to matriculate to Harvard College. And it doesn't happen very often. Um, where it does happen, though, I'll, I'll pause on point two. It sometimes happens. Um, there are incredible merit scholarships at some incredible universities across the across the globe. Um, and we don't have merit scholarships. It's all based on what the family needs in order to be able to come. So that's our commitment to need-based financial aid. Um, pretty interesting. I always find this an interesting statistic. I'm sure many of you are from states with incredible flagship state universities, um, but we find for 90% of the families with whom we work, um, families will pay the same or less to attend Harvard as they would to attend their flagship state university. Um, some other important things to, to keep in mind, um, families who make $65,000 um, or less and have assets typical for families in those ranges are expected to contribute nothing to their son or daughter's education. Um, as you jump up the income scale, so families who make about $150,000 will be expected to contribute about 10% of their income to their son or daughter's education. Um, and then we have many families, hundreds of families on our campus who make well over $150,000 who still qualify for need-based financial aid, often because of um, other 
students in college or caring for uh, elderly parents or relatives or other things um, that families are, are navigating. I would encourage all of you to go to our net price calculator, which is on our financial aid website. Every school in the country is required to have one. Ours is quite short, though. It should take you, you know, five minutes to fill out. You don't need your taxes in front of you. It's meant to be a starting point um, to introduce you to what can seem like an arcane topic. Um, while the calculator is amazing, it's not as amazing as human being colleagues in the financial aid office. So certainly if you have questions, um, how to reach them um, also appears on that website. They can be, they're a tremendous resource. Um, financial aid also sort of ties in to, to admissions. And I know there are lots of admissions questions on the chat and fair enough. You're also, a, you know, it's a huge percentage of rising seniors. We get that. So a couple of important things. We, um, and I'll interweave any COVID changes um, to, to the best that I can. Um, we require, or we ask you to submit um, the Common App, or the coalition app or the universal app so you really have any you have sort of ultimate choice and when you're offered an option it really is an option so for example there's an optional essay um, in the harvard supplement um, in addition to one of those apps you'll submit a short harvard supplement it really is optional we're asked all the time is it better if i submit one do you count if we do it's up to you um, if it were required we would simply tell you we are not trying to trip up anyone in this process, which is already so fraught with, you know, unknowns. Uh, we get that. If we want something, we'll tell you. Um, so similarly, um, you may have, have seen, or no reason you would, I'm happy to, to tell you, for this year only, um, at least at the moment, um, testing is, is optional. Um, and by testing, I mean standardized testing, the SAT or the ACT, just given the un in some cases insurmountable challenges of the pandemic um, we realize that many students um, or some students it may not be as many as we think but um, will not be able to to sit for tests as easily as they could have um, and because everyone's health and safety is paramount um, we've gone test optional for this year only that being said if you've already taken tests and that's a pretty big percentage of students we will see um, if history is or, or it repeats itself um, you should submit those tests to us. Um, but if you don't, um, we will. We have other things to look at. We have your transcripts. We have your teacher recommendations. Um, a word on transcripts. We realize too, schools are going pass fail or um, something else. We get it. We are simply. If we ever have a question about what we're looking at in terms of the transcript, we will reach out to schools and we will ask if they haven't explained it because they have so many other things on their plate. Typically speaking, most successful applicants are generally in the top 10 to 15 percent of their graduating class. Whatever that means at your high school, you know what that means. Pandemic or no pandemic, you know what that means. You've done well in challenging coursework. Um, again, whatever that means at your school. And that means very different things at different schools. So we're always evaluating students within the context of their own environment. Um, I mentioned, so the, the academic piece is really tied up with your transcripts and standardized test scores. Um, most students who apply to Harvard uh, you know, have, have good to excellent grades and have good to excellent standardized test scores. Um, if that's all we had, I don't know what we would do um, in order to, to make our class. And so we, um, your extracurriculars play a role in this and what we think you might be like as a person plays a role in this too, with the huge caveat that we don't know you as well as your teachers um, or your, you know, your parents um, or you yourself. Um, so uh, in terms of extracurriculars, there's no right list of things you should be doing. Um, but you do need to explain to us how you spend your time, um, whether that's in sort of traditional extracurriculars in a school, in your school or your community, perhaps, um, or maybe you um, uh, maybe you can't do any of these things because you spend your time working or you choose to work or you have to care for a sibling or a parent. Um, none of these things is better than the other, but you do have to tell us how you spend your time. We are not mind readers. And the reason we care is that we hope you'll continue to be involved on our campus when you arrive. Maybe not in the same things, I don't care, but in something. As Artha described, just such a great way to meet different groups of friends or um, you know, however you choose to use that extracurricular time. Um, the other piece, and it, you know, again, what kinds of human beings we're inviting to our usually all residential college. Um, we have your teacher recommendations to go on. Um, we ask for two of them. We ask that they be academic subject teachers the junior or the senior year, if at all possible. Um, these help us 
these really tell us things like what you're like in the classroom and how you contribute to the classroom environment. I'm going to see that you're a good student. I saw that right away when I looked at your transcript. But your transcript doesn't necessarily tell me those kinds of things. So choose your teachers wisely and carefully and thoughtfully and give them enough time to write thoughtfully on your behalf. I'll talk about deadlines in a second. Um, the other piece, we'll hear from you. In fact, the only time we get to hear from you, and that will come in the form of your essay um, or personal statement, which is a more accurate descriptor. Um, never has you know, one small piece of writing been given so much airtime and so much, again, maybe angst. Um, here's the deal. You know how to do this. By the time we will see you, you will have been writing at some level you know, for a pretty long time. This is a page or a page and a half. If you write about something that you know about and you care about using words that you normally use and know how to use and know how to spell, it will be a fine piece of writing. Um, really, the end. I, and no one could write your essay except for you. Um, so that's really important too. Write your own essay. I mentioned interviewers earlier, so I do want to close that loop um, before we head to, to some questions. Um, uh, you may have an interview, and I say may simply as a function of where you all live. I completely expect those will be done virtually, just like this, except just the two of you. Um, and so if we have enough someones in your area, this someone will reach out to you, and you'll set up a you know a mutually agreed upon time, I guess not place, to, to meet. Of course, if internet access is an issue for you, um, you know, we can do a phone call, we can manage this for sure, and you'll talk about things like your favorite classes, your favorite activities. This should be a very positive experience. You should feel free to ask this person questions as well. Um, and if someone is not in touch with you, that simply means we don't have enough someones wherever you are. It's not, don't read more into it than that. And we don't expect you to find someone or come up or do whatever. Just we have plenty of other things to look at. Um, but it can just be a nice, if someone's in touch with you, get back in touch with them because it, again, this should be a very positive experience. Um, I want to touch on early action versus regular action. Um, and then again, some really, really great questions in the chat. So I want to um, and give Arthur a chance to speak. Um, but I did see a lot of questions about early and regular. So two different timelines by which you may apply. One under our early action program, restrictive early action. What does that mean? That means if you apply to Harvard under our early program, you don't apply to another school under their early program, um, with the exception of public institutions. Um, at the moment, I do not, there is no talk of that deadline changing. I think that was one of the questions as well. And um, so we're, so I'm giving you kind of the, the information as I have it. That deadline is November 1st. We notify students right around mid-April, uh, excuse me, mid-December, whether they've been admitted, deferred, or denied. Um, most, so if you're admitted, we would love for you to come. This is the um, non-binding piece. You don't have to come. And you don't have to let us know whether you're coming or not until May 1st. So you have lots of time um, to, to make thoughtful choices, compare financial aid packages, whatever you need to do. Or do nothing. Just bask in it. Um, the more traditional timeline, maybe, um, that people are, are you know, still when the majority of students apply and still when the majority of the class is admitted, that deadline is January 1. And we notify students of our decision um, right around the, uh, the end of March or the beginning of April. You should apply when you are ready to put forth your most thoughtful application. End of story. Again, especially now. Who, you know, who knows what the fall looks like going back to schools um, or, you know, so many other things that people are dealing with. Um, there is no, do not rush to apply early because of a perceived advantage. The statistics tell you there is an advantage, and I get that. It's a smaller pool. It's a more select, it's a more self-selected pool. Um, but do not rush to apply early thinking you are getting in a special pile. It doesn't work like that, I promise you. Again, if it did, we'd be pretty clear about that. Why early? We want to be done. But that's not how it goes, I promise. Um, again, I saw some really compelling, much more compelling than what I'm saying, questions in the chat. Um, so I want to make sure that we that we have time for those and, and that Artha um, can, can weigh in because we are so lucky to, to have her here. Um, hold on one second. I think one of the questions that you don't find necessarily on a website, Artha, is, you know, how, um, you know, 
diversity is this word that everyone throws out, and again, maybe now more than ever, um, is Harvard a diverse campus in ways, and in whatever way you define that, and how, you know, what does Harvard do to support students from, from a wide array of backgrounds, if you're comfortable answering that? Yeah, of course. Um, so, Harvard is remarkably diverse in its student body. Like, I was pleasantly surprised when I visited Harvard as um, an admitted student and now as a student on campus to see how diverse in regard to um, experiences, thought processes, race that Harvard truly is. If we are thinking about it from a race perspective, like I have never walked to a space on campus and not run into another student of color. Um, so just to give you some perspective, there's lots of different students from lots of different identities on Harvard's campus. And, you know, as a black woman, there may be spaces on campus and there may be classes in which I'm the only black woman. But um, for me, that's been a really like empowering experience because to be real, like black women, their voices have been silenced or ostracized in different spaces. So having this opportunity to be myself in spaces that need more diversity has been very, very empowering. And sometimes I'm not heard as to the degree that I would like to be heard, but, you know, I still stick it through and go back to the Association of Black Harvard Women, talk about those experiences, talk to my professors who are super open to hearing your experiences about how we can go about that and be better in our efforts in diversity because it's one thing to be diverse and have all of these diverse bodies and diverse thoughts in a space but if those thoughts and those people aren't accepted embraced um, we can't market inclusivity and i think that's just as important as that diversity piece um so yeah i would say harvard is super diverse and we just got a new chief diversity and inclusion officer at the college. She's a black woman, so that makes me super, super happy. Um, and we can see lots of different people in the upper echelons of our administration as well. So I think we're doing well in that respect. I ha wish I had more um, women of color, uh, professors of color in general. I can say in my experience that I haven't had that much diversity in that regard, um, in regard to my teaching staff. But um, they're making efforts to be better about that. I think now more than ever, the conversation has revolved more to like, okay, you made a statement, so what are you doing about it on your campus? And um, I'm so thankful for that. And I think all students of color should find solace in that it's not stopping at just like hiring this person and we're done. Like it's an, evol it's an evolving conversation. So diversity matters here. Thank you so much, Artha. Um, I think we have time for a couple more. I can't imagine how much Tia has been chatting. Um, but I'm, I'm looking for questions that Artha in particular could, could help with. Um, because, again, she's, she's the star of this show. When you were sitting in their seats, you know, working on your college application, um, and not you don't need to tell us what your essay was about, nothing like that, but, like, how did you approach it? How did you, you know, put pen to paper, and, and, and you know, how did you, how did you tackle this process? Yeah, my goodness, what what a process, what a time <laughs> that um, most a lot of you are going through or anticipating going through. And I think for me, it was pretty difficult just to pinpoint what it is that matters to me because I found that writing about things that I actually care about um, was a more fulfilling experience. I had more fun writing my essays because they were things that I cared about and not just whatever someone else wrote about to get into Harvard before me. So I think that was um, one of the things that helped me. And for what that process looked like for me was just sitting down and doing a lot of reflection in the summer before my senior year. So if you are a rising senior around this time, two years ago when I applied to Harvard, I was, or th uh, three years ago, I don't remember, goodness. I guess it was three years ago, whoa. Okay, um, I sat down and did a lot of reflection um, on what matters to me. So beyond academia, of course I was a great student, um, did well in lots of different courses, but what is it that I want to do in life? And I'm sure your reflections may not have to be that profound. I don't know why I went so deep, but that's just the process that works for me. Um, and just journaling, talking to people, what they saw me doing or asking the teachers that I was close enough with, like, what do you think my strengths are as a student or what do you think 
what helped me in the future or what should I maybe look into doing all those kinds of introspection and asking other people reflective questions about my myself and their experience with me to kind of guide how I wanted to write those essays and put together like the most complete uh, version of me for Harvard to evaluate. And we talked about like early admission, regular decision. I did regular decision because of the reasons Christine mentioned earlier. Like I just wanted to make sure that if I was applying to Harvard, I was going to put my best foot forward, get all the time that I needed to get thoughtful recommendations, a thoughtful essay so that I could be the most complete person in Iowa for me. And I was not that person on November 1st, but I got it together by January 1st. <laughs> you sure did. Um, thank you, Artha. And I think I did, by chance um, saw a question come through the chat that I think is a perfect place to end. Um, and knowing, but when I say end, though, please know that our website is a continual um, a, a resource for you all. Virtual tours. Again, we're so sad we can't welcome you all to campus. And I know that that adds a, 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 a another hurdle. But think of it this way. Think of so. In some ways, maybe some of you have more time or more flexibility with your time to really do some deep dives, um, you know, on schools' websites or, um, you know, talking talking with, with students on, you know, on the website. Um, but the, the, the nice place I wanted to end was um, a question for Artha, someone asked, what advice, like, what do you wish you knew your freshman year, advice for your freshman self, things you, you know, might have done differently or not? Definitely. Um, this is such a great question. And just to go off of what Christine said, my profile is on the website somewhere. So if you have any questions specifically for me, feel free to email them to me and I'd get back, I'd love to get back to you. But um, a, something I really wish I would have told my freshman self and probably myself in high school more generally is that it is okay to ask for help. That is not indicative of any like shortcomings that you possess. Like there are so many people who want to help, especially on Harvard's campus especially as someone who's transitioning into a completely new chapter of your life, you will need help and that is okay. And there are so many other people who are going through the same situations as you, that you are. So it's okay to be vulnerable and it's okay to put yourself out there and ask questions, ask meaningful questions, ask a little like trivial questions, ask as much as you can so that you're not, so you don't feel alone or you don't feel lost in what can be a super overwhelming experience. They say that there is no bad question. And I promise you, like, if I would have just opened up more, I could have saved myself a lot of trouble as a first year student at Harvard, trying to find my way to buildings, being late to classes because I just didn't want to ask for help. All of that could have been avoided if I would have just um, kind of put my guard down, took my pride, put my pride aside and asked for help. So don't be afraid to ask for help because you will save yourself a whole lot of heartbreak, a whole lot of trouble that way. So I think that's the biggest piece of advice I'd give my freshman self. And my old self, and always, it's, yes. a, it's a good, it's a good, it's a good way to be. And I'll end. You didn't ask, but my advice is because Artha mentioned something that triggered for me. Like, don't do. You're not going to do what Artha did in high school. You're not going to do what I did in high school. You're not going to write about what what we did. If you do things for a stranger, I mean, we know each other now. But if you do things for a stranger in Cambridge or five other cities, you will find this process terrible. Um, you know, your, your time is limited. Um, and so in the pursuit of things that you enjoy doing, or again, have to do or compelled to do, we get that. Um, you know, coming up with a thoughtful list of places to apply to at any of which you could be happy, you have more choice in this process than you think. Um, you know, you choose, you choose the activities to the extent you can that you pursue. You choose what you write about. You choose you know, where you end up applying. Um, these are big choices. So don't relinquish them to, again, a stranger um, in one of five cities. I don't know how you could also run around and please five different people and five, I'm picking on five, but maybe you apply to 10 schools. You can't. Um, you just have to do your very best in every aspect of your life. You're admitted to Harvard, great. Harvard's great. We love Harvard. There are 3,000 schools in the country and even more abroad. Um, and, and, you know, it's about finding the place 
that um, you know is going to be is going to be a good fit for you. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to end. Um, I want a huge thanks to Artha for offering her perspective to us um, and sharing sharing her her stories with us and for being available. Um, huge thanks to my silent colleagues who are keeping everything running behind the scenes. Um, and huge thanks to all of you for logging in wherever you are. Um, we're so grateful for your time. Um, please stay well. Um, we expect to have, again, check out our website with updates around residents, around other things that we know are on your minds, um, and you know, some of which we just don't have answers for, but still, please do stay tuned. Um, but we do know this, Harvard will be open and, and teaching in some shape or form this fall, um, continuing um, to educate, we hope, um, you know, citizens and citizen leaders um, of the future. So that is for sure. That is happening. It may look different than we're used to, but our community will, will come together in ways that, um, you know, it never has been in, in, because we've never faced this. And we're really proud of our students and our faculty. And again, want to thank you um, very much for your time. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Artha. Thank Have a great you day. so much. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Thank you.